When it comes to quality sleep, Ashley has you covered with top mattress brands at winning prices and with special financing options available. You can snooze now and pay later. Plus, your mattress purchase helps give the gift of better sleep to children in need and U.S. Special Operations Forces. Visit your local Ashley store or shop online today and make every snooze count. Financing is subject to credit approval. See store or ashley.com for details. Rosetta Stone is the language learning program with a lasting impact. I've been using their app to learn French, and it's not just about memorizing words, but actually having real conversations. And it's not just French. They offer 25 languages. Right now, Rosetta Stone has an awesome holiday deal, 50% off their lifetime membership. Every language, unlimited access forever. For anyone keen on diving deep into a new language, check out rosettastone.com. It's a game changer. Welcome to True Crime Garage. Wherever you are, whatever you are doing, thanks for listening. I'm your host, Nick, and with me, as always, is a man that just like Guns N' Roses, once he gets outside of the States, he just totally forgets where he is. He is the captain. Hello, Sydney. Oh, shit. We're in Melbourne. Cheers, mates. Today we are drinking Island Reserve Russian Imperial Stout by the wonderful people at Cisco Brewers Incorporated. Here is a great after dinner beer. Cisco Brewers Island Reserve is a jet black pour. It's a full bodied, very dark in color beer. Good coffee and chocolate flavor with nice hints of fruit. Garage grade four and a quarter bottle caps out of five. And this week's beer was brought to us by these awesome peeps. We have Frederick in Sweden. Long distance cheers to you, my friend. Thank you, Frederick. Next up, in parts unknown, we have Erica and Edna who say, we would like to buy you guys a beer. Well, Erica and Edna, we accept your offer. And we like your jam. We also have Wesley in San Diego. Stay classy, Wesley. Wesley says, I'm always amazed at the thoroughness of each and every case. Thanks for the great podcast. Wesley, thank you, homie. Eat the poop. Let's give a big shout out to Kent in Bloomington, Indiana. Thank you, Kent. We also have Sarah in Columbia, South Carolina. She says, this has become my absolute favorite podcast. Check out Sweetwater Blue. It's my favorite beer. Well, thank Mm. you, Sarah. And I drank a few of those over the weekend, just perhaps. And last but not least, we have Edna in Djibouti, who says... Thanks. Oh, I have started telling people if I do or do not like their jibs. Well, thank you, Adana. Just remember, it's kind. It's very kind to grade jibs on a curve, my friends. And like always, if you'd like to donate to the beer fund, go to truecrimegarage.com and give us a little love. And like always, we like your jib. That's enough of the business. Everybody gather around, grab a chair, grab a beer, and let's talk some true crime. Michael Wells. 
Come on, brother, you know. You know you know. T-shirt, and I want to say electrical cord. No. Think harder. T-shirt and something else. Uh, I'm not going to tell you. I, I but do you know? I want to hear it from you. I'm trying to remember, guys. Something else. This T-shirt and something else. And you helped Rob tie him up. I think, I guess I did. Yeah, you did. What were the girls wearing by the time they were tied up? What were they wearing? Michael, that's a gimme. Yeah. That's an easy one. Not a whole lot. Not a whole lot. They used their own clothes to tie them up. They used their own clothes to tie them up. You and Rob. And by the time you were done, what were they wearing? Say it. Nothing. Nothing. There you go. Back in December of 1991 in Austin, Texas, Four teenage girls were bound and killed in a small yogurt shop. The store, of course, was robbed. And this is a, this is a case that has gripped the city of Austin, Texas, and has gripped the, the state of Texas as well. Mm. We are sitting here now, 25 years later, still asking the question, who killed these girls? So a quick recap, when the firefighters show up to the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop, they realize quickly it's not just an arson, but we have a quadruple homicide. So that's going to be assigned to Detective Jones and Detective Huckabee. And in my opinion, those two detectives, I think they worked the case very well. They had a lot of issues here with the with the investigation. Mm -hmm. This being, we have people making confessions. And that is tough because a lot of these confessions are pretty wild, uh, according to Jones and Huckabee. Uh, they're, they're able to easily, quickly sit down with these different people, these confessors, and figure out early in their stories that they don't know certain details of the crime, things that would have taken place that evening or evidence that was left and collected at the scene. They're unaware of what actually took place. So we're able to quickly dismiss several of these confessors. Eight days after the murders took place, they arrest Maurice Pierce, which had a 22 caliber gun, which was the gun used in at least three of the murders. And he implements his teenage friends. Um, Jones and Huckabee kind of get to the bottom of this guy is just kind of bullshitting. Yeah, and uh, on top of that, the gun does not match the ballistics of the bullets that were found on the scene. So they, they get rid of these suspects, and they clear them, and they've moved on in the case, right? Mm -hmm. So leads are starting to dry up now. And in 1992, we have a madman that's running amok in the state of Texas. He's a known serial killer. He was somebody that was released by the Texas prison system, and he's been suspected of new killings. Well, they track him down in 1992, and they suspect that he possibly could have done this crime because he was somewhat in the area around the time that the crime was committed. He would have been in Austin, Texas. They can place him there about 23 days after the crime. Yeah, within a month, him and another person uh, abduct a lady, uh, and they rape her and murder her. Yeah. Uh, she was abducted from a downtown car wash, and this, this crime took place, the yogurt shop murders took place in North Austin City. And that killer's name, that serial killer's name is Kenneth McDuff. He's eventually, you know, they stop looking at him because there's really nothing that ties to him as far as forensics goes. In 1994, Detective Jones, who was the lead investigator of the yogurt shop murders, mm -hmm. he receives a promotion and they move him off of the case. The case is considered cold at this point. Now, in 1996, we have other detectives that would move in and start looking at this case with fresh eyes. In 1997, we have a serial killer that is captured. He will become known as the fast food killer. Yeah, he was a pretty bad dude, and he was running amok in the state of Tennessee. Uh, what his MO was, was he would walk into a fast food restaurant, mm -hmm. and he would really take the scene over. He would, he would take control of the scene by holding a gun to everybody. He would make a quick robbery. He would usually steal the surveillance tapes if there were any. He would execute all of the persons in the store, and then he would leave. Within a very short time period, from February 16, 1997 to April 23, 1997, he robbed three different stores, and in the course of, he ended up killing a total of seven people. Yeah, and he's not just a suspect because he is known to rob, you know, McDonald's or Captain D's and that, you know, the yogurt shop it would fall kind of in that line. Mm -hmm. He 
he is also from the area of Texas. Yeah, he was he was born in Texas, and at a young age, he started getting in trouble with the law. In 1983, he robs a Houston steakhouse, and he's convicted of aggravated armed robbery. He receives mm-hmm. a 20 year prison sentence for this, but he's paroled after just seven years. He's paroled in 1990. Which and he stays in the Texas area. He becomes a truck driver. So he was in the area, at, you know, in ninety one. Yes, and during this time, he's he's driving a truck. He ends up in some kind of bad accident, and he receives quite a handsome settlement for this. And he decides that he's going to get some <laughs> plastic surgery because well, it's, it's funny that you said a handsome, uh, you know, and then rolled it into plastic surgery. Right, right. Well, he's kind of an ugly kid. Mm-hmm. Um, I'll go ahead and throw that out there. And, and he makes himself look a little better and he decides he wants to move to Nashville to become mm-hmm. a, a country Western singer. Nash Vegas. Yeah. I believe he wanted to become the next Garth Brooks. No, but he had the talent of Billy Ray Cyrus. Yeah. I, that might be, that might be giving him far too much credit. Mm-hmm. Uh, but there are some reasons to suspect that he might have done this. This is so- certainly something he would have been capable of. However, his crimes were a little bit different in the sense that he, he didn't rape anybody involved in these, these crimes that he committed up in Tennessee. Now I'm not saying he's not capable of doing so. It really seems like his motive was for the money You're, and yeah. a financial gain. And it wasn't, you know, where these crimes, these yogurt shop murders really seem like to me more sexual in nature. Mm-hmm. And it just was by, you know, well, I'm leaving the crime scene. I might as well take some money with me as I go. Yeah. And it, at the yogurt shop, they only, the whoever got away with this, they only took $540 mm-hmm. and they spent a decent amount of time there assaulting the girls, his crimes. He got into a place he would take as much money as he could. Most of the time we're talking about upwards of 2000 or $3,000 each time. Mm-hmm. And he would, he would leave no evidence and he would kill everybody in the store. He was quick in and quick out, which is not what we saw in the yogurt shop murders. Plus he was never known to work with anybody else. I think the yogurt shop, it looks like a situation where you have more than one assailant. So detectives looking into Paul Reed, they kind of realize he's kind of a lone cowboy. He's, you know, he's not tag team back again. Um, but this will lead them to go back through their notes and start to re-question some people that, that Jones and Huckabee already questioned back in 91. Yeah, they're going through the file. They're going over this case time and time again. And what they keep going back to is this Maurice Pierce keeps standing out to them. Mm-hmm. And his three friends that he has, Robert Springsteen, Michael Scott, and Forrest Wilborn. Hmm, the uh, East Street Band. Yeah, so they decide that, you know what, this is the most likely situation. These guys did it. Uh, Maurice Pierce looks very guilty. He has a twenty two caliber gun on him mm-hmm. just days after the crime. He mentions the crime to people. He's kind of a natural-born criminal. Yeah, so he is picked up, and this would be in October of 1999. They arrest all four men. Mm -hmm. And they are going to sit each one of them down individually. And now we're going to start getting some answers, some much long awaited answers that we've been looking for in this crime. Well, they're going to start getting answers because they're going to force these answers upon these these suspects. Yeah. To say that the interrogation was aggressive might be an understatement of the century. Yes. Um, So what happens is they pull in the four. They're talking to him, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, Maurice Pierce has got nothing to offer. You know, he keeps saying that, nope, I, I didn't have anything to do with this. I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, even though, you know, Maurice at the time uh, of 90 and 91, he was like 15 or so. Mm-hmm. So he's just this punk kid. He had the 22 caliber. He, you know, basically implements his friends into the, the crime. But it, it, that was just kind of him being a dumb, you know, dumbass 15 year old. Yeah. I believe his statement was that he had lent the gun to Forrest Wilborn and that Forrest had used the gun in the yogurt shop murders. This is what put them on the radar from the get go. Mm -hmm. Now, when they're talking to them as said, here's, here's what their thought is going into this. Okay. So they believe that Maurice Pierce is some kind of criminal mastermind and he organized this whole, uh, robbery. Mm -hmm. Right. And they believe that Robert Springsteen helped and Michael Scott helped. Mm -hmm. They believe that Forrest Wilborn would have been the lookout guy or the driver. Um, They believe that it would have taken a group of men to, to commit these crimes. Now keep in mind though, these are just teenage boys at the time. Now 
they're being questioned years later as adults, right? We have two of them that might be willing to talk, and we have two of them that they don't know anything. Right. Maurice Pierce, he doesn't know anything. Forrest Wilborn, he doesn't know anything. They're not admitting to anything. In 1999, two of the suspects are 24. Uh, Michael James Scott is 25, and Forrest Wilborn is 23. Now, they get Michael Scott to crack first, right? And this is quite the long process. We're talking mm-hmm. about hours and hours of interrogation. And to to listen to the confession, to view it, you will see that the story is changing as Michael's telling it. Uh, yeah. yeah, and if you listen to the trailer, that was about seven hours into one of the interrogations. Mm-hmm. So where he is, they finally broken him down. They finally get him to the point where he admits that he was there, mm-hmm. that he had taken place in the crime. Now he, they got to go through the details because they got to confirm that he was actually there. Well, and that's the problem. Mm-hmm. He doesn't know the details. No, he doesn't get a lot of them right without being coaxed to, to mm-hmm. getting it right. You know, he would often give a wrong answer and they would tell him, no, that's not it. Think harder. You need to try harder. Yeah. And the detective keeps saying, I'm not going to give you the right answer, right? Yeah. I'm not going to give you the right answer. But what he does constantly is he tells you when your answer is wrong. So by a process of elimination, you're going to get to the right answer. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, they were tied up with their clothes. Okay, they were tied up with their clothes. Well, what clothes? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, well, maybe this part of their clothes. No, wrong. Mm -hmm. You know, and he keeps doing that. And until he gets the right answer. And just to paint the picture for you, if you've not seen the confession tapes, mm-hmm. they, Michael Scott, he is literally sitting with his back up against the wall. I mean, he's pushed up against the wall and he has two detectives on each side of him right up in his face. And they're all sitting down in chairs and they are right up in his face and they are very aggressive. Well, got the, they got the good cop and bad cop going. They got one cop that kind of leans back constantly. Mm-hmm. And then the, the main cop questioning is like maybe a couple inches from his face. Yeah. So every time, no, no. Yeah. Yeah. You get you got the bad cop saying, no, you didn't get that right. And the good cop is saying, it's okay, Michael. You can tell us. We know you know the answers. Mm-hmm. Um, so they play that game for quite some time. And we'll, let's go through Michael Scott's confession. Mm-hmm. Okay. He states that they were, all four of them, they were hanging out at the North Cross Mall, which was very close to the yogurt shop. Mm -hmm. And that Maurice Pierce is in need of money. So he comes up with this idea that we're going to go rob someplace. And he actually picks out the yogurt shop. They agree to go to the yogurt shop. Yeah, which is probably a pretty common place for teenagers in that town because most of the employees there are teenagers. He says that the, the event starts off like this. Maurice goes into the yogurt shop and places an order. Mm -hmm. And then Robert and Michael, they go in and they ask to use the restroom. They want to go to the back of the store to see what's going on in the back. Mm -hmm. Now, during that time, they're going to open up the back door and they're going to prop it open. And like we have from the reports, the back door was propped open and the front door was locked. Yeah. And they're going to wait for the store to close at 11 o'clock. Now, after the store closes, Maurice and Robert are going to go back in through the propped open back door and they are going to, they have guns at this point and they are going to rob this place, right? Mm -hmm. What ends up happening is during the course of this robbery, they ask the women, the girls, I'm sorry, to remove their clothing. uh, This being Robert. And then Michael Scott, he ties up the girls and he gags them. Then Maurice, he's demanding money from the girls, but they refuse or they say something like there is no money. And when this happens, Maurice shoots two of the girls. Robert then hits one of the girls and he rapes her. Yeah, which again, this all lines up with the reports. Now, the fourth girl is screaming and she's begging for her life. She's begging that they do not shoot her. Mm -hmm. Um, Michael Scott then pretends to sexually assault her. He's saying that he was being told by the other guys to, to rape her and that he, he just pretended to sexually assault the girl. And he can't remember at this point, which suspect handed him the gun. Yeah. And it's at this point that he does shoot that girl. And then he would go on to shoot Amy who was raped by Robert. And at this point, Michael Scott then says he is the one that stacks the body 
and he also says that he's the one that I think administers the the accelerant. You're exactly right. Again, uh, something that's a little strange because a 24, 25 year old, uh, this is cop speak. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of detectives that have looked, detectives and lawyers that have looked at these confessions say it's funny because the, the actual written accounts, because you have mm-hmm. the verbal confessions and we have those taped. And those are horrendous enough, but then they have to take all those statements and then now put them on paper. And basically by looking at the the written statements, these cops go, well, it's kind of strange that the, these kids are constantly using cop speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's like they're picking up words as they're going along. And, and they state that, you know, it would have been more common to hear a criminal say lighter fluid rather Mm -hmm. than accelerant. Um, at this point they leave the building through the back door uh, they leave it propped open, and Michael Scott says that the whole this whole thing only takes about twenty minutes from the time that they enter the building after closing until they leave. Now, when they get back to the vehicle, Forrest Wilborn is no longer in the vehicle; he has left. Yeah, rumor has it he's off somewhere playing a pretend game of pocket pull. Yeah, and actually, the the three boys drive around and they're looking for Forrest, and they find him in a park. Mm-hmm. Uh, they pick him up, and then at some point. They are going to ditch a knife that they had taken from the crime scene. I'm guessing this would have been to cut up some of the girl's clothing or belongings to use them as, you know, bindings. Mm -hmm. Um, The other boy that confessed, the man now, Robert Springsteen, his confession is similar. It does line up with some of the things that Michael Scott said. Mm -hmm. Um, One of those, one of the key things here is that they both admit that Robert raped Amy, which that's kind of a, a, a percentage kind of thing, right? When you think about it, you have four assailants and one only, they're saying only one girl was raped. Well, I mean, let's go back a little bit on this because detectives, yeah, we have four suspects, but detectives are already kind of leading them on to this idea that, well, Forrest was outside. Mm-hmm. They, so there now there's only three. Mm-hmm. So you got a 33% chance of getting the person right. That's you true. Know. That's true. Yeah. And they, they both said that Forrest was outside as well. And they both said that the door, the back door was propped open. It's a little unclear on Robert's statement as to when he's saying the back door was propped open. Was it propped open to get back into the store or was it propped open when they left the store? Mm -hmm. Um, he also seems to have some knowledge of the other bullet. Remember we said there was a second gun used in the situation he seems to have some kind of knowledge that there was a 38 involved, not just this 22 that they were already aware of. Right. Which again, all of this starts lining up with the reports. But again, his confession is much shorter, much less detail. And there are parts of it, you know, that do not match up with Michael Scott's. Uh, there are some things that, that these guys do not get right. Yeah. And one of the main things that like defenders of these, Austin four is what we'll call them is that it's the, you know, Robert claims that he, they stacked the bodies and then he lit the bodies on fire, right? Which the initial reports from the, the firefighters uh, and the fire chief and the fire investigation was that no, the bodies weren't actually set on fire, that it would have been the shelves. If you look at the crime scene though, they're right beside each other. Yeah, it, they would have been, the body stack would have been about, you know, just four or five feet from this stock shelf, you know, where you have plastic cups or, mm-hmm. I'm sorry, styrofoam cups and things of that nature. Um, it's it's not crazy to, to think that maybe this shelf wouldn't have fallen over at some point. Um, but Michael says that he had used these styrofoam cups with lighter fluid mm-hmm. to to light the body stack on fire. Now, what would end up happening is after they get these confessions... Um, they would go back and they would find a new fire investigator to take a look at the crime scene. And this fire investigator says, you know what? I disagree with the previous findings. What actually happened is that the, the body stack is where the fire had originated from. Well, this is what is so freaking annoying, right? I mean, we see this time and time again in these cases that go unsolved. Most of the time when a case goes unsolved, it's because these detectives, not, not Jones, not Huckabee, but these detectives go on this uh, this mission. We have a theory. Now let's prove the theory. Mm-hmm. And like we've always heard, uh, some of the smartest detectives that we've met and that we've interviewed, uh, you know, trying to do our job a little bit better on the podcast, get some insider information. 
it's the guys that say, look, I am not smart enough to, to imagine what happened. Mm -hmm. So I let the evidence present itself to me and present the story to me. Yeah. You follow the evidence. You don't come up with a theory theory and make the shoe fit. Right. And, and some of the detectives that we've talked to in the Columbus PD have been really good about this. And the idea that they've even said, Hey, look, when you're working on a homicide, you might have two, three detectives involved, sometimes more. Right. And they've talked several times about how they've had uh, partners or people that they've thought really highly of that would come up with theories. Mm -hmm. And then they'd have to rope them back in. Hey, man, you're just you're just trying to make the shoe fit. Mm -hmm. Knock it off. This is not Cinderella. Right. Right. And the, the thing here is here's some other things that don't actually fit. Right. Mm -hmm. And these are things in their written confession. So we have the, the back door was propped open. One thing that they could not agree on was what did they use to prop open the back door? Mm -hmm. One had said it was a rock. One had said that it was a pack of cigarettes. The problem being here is that, again, according to their story, the door would have been propped open on two different occasions. So it's possible that both items were actually used. Well, and let's, let's just remind the listeners. I mean, this, is, this questioning has happened in 1999 and not 1991. Mm -hmm. So some of your account is going to be off. Right. Now, one thing that, that they couldn't get right to was they had said that the murders took place inside the office. Well, this was a big red flag to the original detective that was mm -hmm. on the case, Detective Jones, because he states that when the police arrived on the scene, there was no evidence that anyone had entered that office. It was a locked door, and it was mm -hmm. locked when they arrived. Um, the murders 100% took place in the back room in that stocking area, in that prep area that we had talked about. And they probably know that. for Well, again, this case is so tough because of the arson mm -hmm. and, and because the firefighters did not know that they were going into a, a crime scene mm -hmm. and because they were trying to put out that, that those fires, that probably really disturbed uh, any blood splatter. Mm -hmm. So, it, it, you know, we can't say 100% that that's where that happened. But what we can say is that when detectives showed up on the scene, 100% that office was locked. And they had to actually get a key from somebody to unlock lock that office, which makes a lot of sense because who is left in charge of shutting down the yogurt shop? Mm -hmm. Two teenage girls. Right. And and so the manager, I'm sure, would go, okay, I'm going to lock this up. Or or maybe that was part of their duty. You know, you put the money away, lock it up. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think there was a key on on site and then I don't think there was a key to the office that even the, the, the teenage girls had. Well, and keep in mind too, this under this premise, right? According to their story, the whole reason anything took place there that night was because it was a robbery. Mm -hmm. The motive was to rob the store and get money, which I think both of us agree that that wasn't the motive. I, I don't think so. You're exactly right. The thing here is though, captain, if the, if the whole motive was robbery, Remember, we're saying that they were inside that store under their own words for 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. I would argue that it might be closer to an hour that somebody was in the store. But regardless, there was a lot of things that took place once that store closed mm -hmm. and, and a lot of things happening. And I can't I wouldn't be able to sit here and have somebody tell me that there was a key in that store or that there was access to the key to the robbers and that they didn't go into the office looking for more money or valuables. Mm -hmm. If that, if, if robbery was the motive. Now, Michael Scott did get the, um, the positioning of the bodies. Correct. He, he had a, a good idea of that as well as he did know that Amy was not on the body stack. He knew that, that she, she was in a separate area. The problem I have with this statement, and this is exactly what the police said. They said, you know, he got he got the body positioning right. That That's really tough to do. And I will give them that. But here's where I have a problem. Mm -hmm. One thing he did not get right is he didn't he wasn't able to fully describe the layout of the store. So, yeah, maybe you could get the positionings of the bodies right. But how could you get the positionings of where they were inside the store? You see what I'm saying? With right, right. If you don't even know it or understand the layout of the store. Well, and there's a lot of things, and we'll, we'll get right back into uh, not only what did they got right, but how they got those things right right after this quick. This show is sponsored by BetterHelp. 
Do you look forward to the holidays? Maybe you struggle with seasonal blues. This time of year can be a lot, and it's natural to feel some sadness or even anxiety about it. But adding something new and positive to your life can counteract some of those feelings. Therapy can be a bright spot, something to look forward to, to make you feel grounded, and to give you the tools to manage everything going on. If you're thinking of starting therapy, give BetterHelp a try. It's entirely online, designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist and switch therapist at any time for no additional charge. Find your bright spot this season with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash garage today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash garage. Dreaming of overseas adventures or connecting more deeply with family from afar? Rosetta Stone bridges the language gap. I've tried others, but Rosetta Stone's immersive lessons and voice feedback technology are game changers. Dive into 25 languages by learning intuitively, just like when you were a kid. And here's the holiday sparkle. Grab a lifetime membership now and save 50%. Gift yourself the world. Head to rosettastone.com now and save 50%. The Angie's List you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews. But now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's List is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today. Break. Going through the items that the confessions got right and the things that they got wrong. Uh, continuing on that path here, I want to spend a little bit of time talking about this 38. You know, mm-hmm. we had mentioned that uh, Michael Scott doesn't seem to know about a second gun. He never mentions anything about the 38. However, Robert is aware of the 38. Um, and this is presented as a problem for these young men and for their their eventual prison sentence, right? Because this this supposed 38, which we know existed, mm-hmm. however, the police are saying this was a fact that they kept close to them, that the people in the general public would not have known about that. I, I tend to disagree a little bit with that statement mm-hmm. because, as we had said, there had been 50 confessions. And one thing that the police state was with, with anybody that seemed to have knowledge of the crime— they went out and looked for the 38 because they had other confessors say that, you know, I dumped the gun here. Well, and we also have four teenage boys and the murder victims were four teenage girls. So we're talking about a lot. In, and now eight years have passed. So you have eight years of a uh, not a small town. I mean, this is about uh, half a million people in Austin mm-hmm. at this uh, in 91. But you have a lot of people in this community talking about this. This was huge news for them. So there is a lot of talk. Yeah. So the, there is there, it's a very good possibility that they, one, heard that there was more than one weapon. Yep. And, and, not, and, and also, we're not talking about just four kids that have not been involved in this crime. We're talking about four teenage boys that were basically arrested or brought in for questioning eight days after the event. Yeah. Yeah. So they may have been told about the 38 then. I mean, if you're sitting in a room eight years ago and somebody's asking you, well, what about the other gun? Mm -hmm. What about this? uh, Wasn't there a 38 involved? And and you're saying at that time, you don't know anything about it. Well, it's easy to jump to that conclusion when your back's up against the wall and you're being, you're being forced to give answers that that you might not have any knowledge of. Well, and you got this detective, you know, two inches from your face. And I mean, he might have bad breath, who knows? But the fact of the matter is, you know, the, the main point of all these confessions that is so blatant is that, yeah, they did get some stuff right, mm-hmm. but how did they get that stuff right? Right. They didn't just say something, you know, uh, a perfect example in the trailer is when he says, well, yeah, they were bound up by, I want to say electrical cord. Right. Right. And he goes, nope, that's not it. They got to majority of these right answers by the the detectives kind of forcing it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they're, they're really, you can hear, you can hear, especially Michael Scott, you can hear him kind of guessing answers, and then he's looking to them at, for approval. 
You know, mm-hmm. did I get that one right? It's almost like it's almost like a, a kid in school hoping to get the right answer from the teacher holding the textbook. And and the teacher keeps asking questions and saying, no, that's not it. Try it again. And and he keeps changing his answers or modifying his answers to get closer to what the police know to be true. Now, on that 38, we do have Robert who does claim that they dumped it somewhere. Mm -hmm. And of course they go and look for it. Now, mind you, it's eight years later. I have had, I've heard people say, well, this, this proves that they're innocent. Well, the gun easily could have disappeared from wherever they placed it eight years ago. Right. Um, but, but again, we have this situation where they are arriving at answers. These aren't answers that they walked in and sat down with. The other thing that I have a problem with here is you still have two guys that haven't confessed to anything. Right. You have two guys you have two guys that claim to know very much about the crime and two guys that seem to know nothing and even when they are presented by investigators, well we know you did it because so and so told us this and told us that. They hold true and they sit there and say, "Nope, I mm. uh, wasn't there. I don't know what you're talking about." The the other thing too regarding Michael Scott's confession is that part on the tape where he says, you know, he's asked who was there with you. Right. And, and he he names two of the other people he names. I, you know, I was there with Maurice. Mm-hmm. I was there with Robert and I was there with Forrest. And he and he says it in a way that he's like right. asking a question. I'm Ron Burgundy. Yeah. And they take it as, OK, well, now we got the four people that we wanted to hear. We wanted to hear all four of those names. Why? Because you have to go back to 1991 when they originally questioned these guys. They need Forrest to be there. Why? Because the reason why they picked up Maurice and started questioning him about the yogurt shop murders is because he said he lent the gun to Forrest Mm -hmm. and Forrest had used it in the yogurt shop murders. That's what put them on the radar. So they really needed Maurice to be there as well as Forrest, even if those two didn't confess to anything. Right. And with Forrest, I mean, it's pretty simple. I mean, his interview, um, you know, I, I believe it's with Dateline. I found very compelling and, and very believable because he's pretty much saying, look, I was not going to lie and, 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 and especially not going to lie about this. Mm-hmm. And there's no way I did this. So there is no way you're going to get, get me to say that. Now, this is what, this is what's weird because the community and obviously the victim's parents are going to start going, well, these guys are monsters, right? Mm-hmm. These guys are savages. And, um, and they need to be locked away, you know, maybe death penalty. And and because a lot of people have a really hard time wrapping their head around, why would you confess to a crime that you didn't commit? Mm-hmm. And I would like to believe that that would, would just not be possible with me. Mm-hmm. But, you know, nobody would know this until you're actually in that situation. I had a situation many years ago where I was uh, observing a trial. Right. And I had, I was close to a turn, an attorney that was involved in the trial and they put one person on the stand. And this is before it got to an actual jury trial because Mm -hmm. they were trying to determine if they should just plea this thing out or if it should go to a jury trial. And one of the, the, the attorney was representing a person who wanted it to go to a jury trial. The defendant wanted it to go to a jury because they, believe they were innocent. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't know what actually took place, but I was in the hallway and I overheard what the attorney was saying to the defendant. The attorney was saying, let's plead this thing out. And the defendant was adamant. No, it's got to go to a jury because I'm innocent. I'm not pleading to anything. Right. And the attorney said, well, the reason why I'm saying we should plead to this is because they're offering a very low plea bargain. You know, it's something small, like pay a fine and we pretend this never happened. Right. Right. He's saying, let's just take this penalty and agree to it. Why? Because the, the man that was just on the stand that was on, he was on the stand for almost the course of a whole day. And he said, you do not want him to be on the stand in a jury trial. And the defendant said, well, he's lying. And Mm -hmm. the attorney said he might be lying, but here's my perception of this guy. Okay. And this is what I believe a jury will think. This guy comes off as not being very bright. He comes off almost to be too dumb to lie mm-hmm. where he, he, he would be perceivably believable to a jury, a, an audience of such of a, a jury. Uh, and I, I found this to be something that I kind of kept in the back of my mind 
when I was when I was reviewing stuff regarding Forrest Wilborn because we have a guy here that never confesses to anything, right? Mm-hmm. And and on top of that, we have we have we have people from Dateline, we have investigators from the original investigation that that they all claim that, you know, Forrest is not a bright guy. You right. know, he's not a smart guy. You know, he couldn't organize a, a two car parade. Mm-hmm. Uh, he here's the way he strikes me. And I, and I feel bad for the guy because not only was he brought to and, and faced charges regarding this crime, but on top of that, then publicly he's put down for for his mental capabilities or whatever they are. Right. And I don't to, look. I think it's just frankly insulting. I mean, he Definitely. seems he seems like a, a nice character. And at the end of the day. Uh, he was smart enough not to confess to a crime he didn't commit. And the big problem I have with his portion of this, okay, he is stating I was never there. He he never admits to anything, right? Mm-hmm. Now you got two guys that place him at the scene. Now, okay, now wouldn't investigators say, okay, let's make a deal with Forrest. Let's make a deal with him because guess what, Forrest? We know you were there. We were told by these other guys that you sat out in the car. You didn't have any involvement with the actual rape, the actual tying up of the girls, the Mm -hmm. actual robbery, the actual killing of anybody. You were just on the outside of the building waiting for these other guys to return. And by their own omission, when they when they returned to the vehicle or returned outside of the yogurt shop, you had fled the scene. You, you clearly didn't want any involvement with this, right? Forrest. Right. So, Forrest, why don't you tell us the truth and we might be able to grant you immunity or we might be able to grant you a slap on the wrist. And, and because had they got a third confession, that would have been, that would have been paramount in this case. Right. Right. But Forrest has something going for him in this case. Yeah. You got two guys confessing and saying that you're involved in the case, but you got another one of the individuals saying, Oh yeah, by the way, he wasn't there because I wasn't there and this shit didn't happen. Right. Right. The other thing, too, is I want to know more about the timeline. One thing that they don't go for in the confession, they want to know details of the actual crime. But one thing that they fail to do is to wrap these guys up and on a specific timeline. And what I mean by that is we have Michael Scott, who says that the whole thing took about 20 minutes from the time we entered the building to the time that we left the building. Mm-hmm. Well, what do we know? We know that the doors were locked at 11 p.m. And we know that around midnight, the flames were seen and firefighters were responding to a to a fire call. Well, OK, so that's one hour. Well, now let's go ahead and look at what the neighbor said. Remember, the neighbor had said that we have a situation here where we get a summary of his report of that night. And it would be nice to have the full report yeah. be- because the neighbor states that he had heard some popping noises thought something was a noise was coming from the roof. He went outside to investigate and that's when he saw the door propped open along with a fire. Okay. Well, here's, here's a little bit of an issue with that. What time did they enter the building? Could, could we, could we have had them narrow that down during this confession? Because that seems to me to be an important part of it because it, it may not line up with what the neighbor is saying. Well, I right, I, which I understand all that, but at the end of the day, this confession don't, doesn't mean shit to me on the idea that this all this information was force fed to him. And if you don't believe that, uh, w- one of the things is when they're talking about, oh, well, then then I put a gun to this girl's head, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, then the detective goes behind. Uh, I can't remember which one. It, it was, was Michael. Michael. He goes behind Michael's head and puts a freaking gun to his head yeah and and so then the then the detective is on record saying well i didn't put a gun to his head i put my finger on his head mm-hmm. no no you, you you showed the suspect a gun you then put something on the back of his head you, I've, well, I've seen the video footage it looks like he put a freaking gun on his head yeah and not only that he walks behind michael to do so yeah. so so michael may not have known even if it wasn't a gun you would assume it would be a gun you know, right, and I understand that the community is outraged and that they want answers and all that stuff, but you are making up a bunch of malarkey, right? Mm-hmm. And uh, and so then, you know, just to fast forward, we can't charge two of them because we don't have confessions. And we don't have any forensic evidence linking these individuals to the crime, 
And maybe part of that is due to the arson, but now we're going to put these two men on trial yeah. and the other two are just going to be let go. Yeah. So yeah, a quick breakdown of that is we have Robert who confessed, Michael who confessed. Okay. So they're in a whole heap of trouble. We have Maurice does not confess to anything. He's, he's originally charged. However, they could not get an actual indictment. They couldn't get anybody to bring it to court because of a few things. He didn't confess. And mm-hmm. on top of that, the gun that he was, was found on his person eight days after the crime did not match the ballistic test. So he's, he's released because of that and never fully tried for, for this crime. Now we have Forrest. Now he's in the same boat. He did not confess to the crime. And the thing that's going to get him off was remember he way back in the day, back in 1991, eight days after the crime, after they pick him up and they're talking to him, he actually hooked him. They hooked him up to a polygraph, which he passed right. on that day. This would be one of the reasons that the original investigators would let him go. But this would also be a reason that they couldn't try him for this eight years later. Well, and another thing that I find really interesting is as they're going through this process, you know, you got detective Jones and you got detective Huckabee saying, Hey, we, we question these guys. Mm-hmm. We know what's up. These guys shouldn't be looked at. Why the hell are you guys bringing them to trial? Right. right. And they, and they, and then they see, you know, and then obviously they get to see the footage of their interrogation and realize this is, uh, you know, just, just watch it. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that this, this is a awful detective work. So Robert and Michael would go forward and they would be charged with these crimes. Mm-hmm. Now what takes place in their trial is, uh, Robert, they basically use Michael's statement, his confession against Robert. And they use Robert's confession against Michael Mm -hmm. and they're tried separately. However, not neither of those guys are called to the stand in those trials. So what takes place is you have Robert who is sentenced to death and it's later commuted to life because they, they decide that, you know what? He was a teenager when the crime was committed and you can't, you know, you can't charge a, um, uh, a child and sentence them to death. Mm -hmm. Now with, with Michael, He's sentenced to life in prison. What ends up happening is in 2006, these convictions are overturned because you, you have, we have the right to address our people that accuse us of stuff. Mm -hmm. And because neither of these guys were called to the stand, they weren't able to cross examine what they had stated. Therefore you have to overturn these charges. All right. So eight days after these crimes are committed, that these teenage boys are called in. Eight years later, they are questioned again. Then they go on trial. They are put away, sentenced to life in prison or death penalty, which is then overturned. And then several years of being in jail, they are released based off of... Yeah, they're not fully released. What they do is they 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 hold them because they're going to try them again. Right. And okay, they're, yeah. now they're we're going released, to do it right. the right way <laughs> is mm-hmm. what we're going to do. Well, they're being held for quite some time. Yeah, of course. They don't make it. It's just like with Adnan Syed, right? Mm-hmm. It, you know, everybody got so excited, right, that, that you know, he's going to get an actual trial. Mm-hmm. And I think, uh, you know, the true crime community, uh, whether or not you think he's innocent or guilty, everybody agrees that the trial was ridiculous right right and the evidence they had against this kid was ridiculous questionable yeah very questionable and so now we have a situation where he's just sitting mm-hmm. right and he's sitting and waiting right and, and basically he's still in prison the whole time you right. know you know which is ridiculous and the same thing's happening here yeah and not only that you have the right to a speedy trial and right. if these guys have already been in prison for quite some time i'm sure they would like to be out you know while they wait for their new trial right but during this holding time what do we have? We get we get a little forensic evidence. Mm-hmm. We get some DNA. Well, yeah, it, it, this all kind of comes to a close all the, about the same time because eventually the judge comes at the prosecutor and says, "Look, you've got to put together a case against these guys, and mm-hmm. you got to do it soon. We're not just going to hold them forever while you wait to try them." And they were ready to take. And I, I'm going to get the names wrong or, or the order wrong. But they were ready to go forward on the trial with one of the suspects. I believe it was Robert. Right. And then with the other one, 
they weren't ready. Mm-hmm. And so that was the thing was, well, if you guys aren't ready, well, screw you. Right. You know, right. if you're not ready, then you need to release this guy. And at the same time, like we said, forensics comes up and then they take a DNA test. Yeah, they, they have DNA technology that was not available back to, the, to them back in 1991. Mm-hmm. Now, using this technology, they, they have DNA, and this is male DNA, obviously, and they are able to determine that the DNA that they found in Amy does not match that of Robert. Mm-hmm. Now we have that makes a big problem with both of their confessions because they both said that Robert raped Amy. Right. Um, furthermore, this DNA does not match any of the four. Right. And this becomes a big problem because the only, you know, so the confession we know are wrong. Mm-hmm. We know that they, they pushed them into that. You know, they pushed Robert to claim that he raped the girl, which, you know, I think um, would be a very difficult thing to admit to doing. Um, but nonetheless, you know, that that part of the story doesn't line up. Right. But now on top of that, we got five people. Well, yeah, you yeah. Know, this is this is the prosecutor pivoting and saying, okay, well, we can roll with that new evidence. Right, right, yeah. Instead of going, hey, let's try to find the truth. Hey, let's just make up this, you know, fictitious person. You know, we, we have, you know, in this case, we have pretend rape and we have fictitious people. And now <laughs> you... There was no mention in 1991 of, of a fifth person. Police never in suspected a fifth person. There was a never a fifth person. Then all of a sudden, now there's a fifth person. These guys are still guilty. These guys are still guilty. There's just a fifth person we never heard of. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, this is just ridiculous. So what then happens is they're released. Yeah. In, in 2009, uh, they are released. And um, rightfully so. And the case does not die there. I mean, it does not end there because what would end up coming out later would be that we would have the attorneys, the two defense attorneys, they come out and they say, you know what? There is evidence that there is a second and a possible third male DNA that was found at the scene. Right. And we had always, we had always suspected that more than one of the girls was actually sexual assaulted. Right. And the, that's what the defense attorneys are saying. Now, the prosecutor and law enforcement have never s- outwardly stated that. They've always stuck to, there's been one set of DNA that did not match any of the four guys. Therefore, there must have been a fifth guy there. Yeah, but once they do the DNA testing, they have to present that evidence to the defense teams. Well, and on top of that, these def- these defense attorneys are saying, not only did this second and possible third DNA that was found, it, not, you know, it didn't match these two guys. It didn't match any of the four. Right. So now how many people are you going to start claiming were, were there committing this crime? And now, and, right. And now we have two individuals that were arrested and spent time in jail and they can go after, um, restitution. Know. Yeah. They could go after restitution. The, the, the issue here though, is the state of Texas has a clause basically stating that just to be released from prison or to have an, an to have an, a conviction overturned, does not mean that you are due restitution. Right. You have to actually be proven innocent, which is going to be very hard to do, especially <laughs> when you have these false confessions that are still lingering and you have a public and a law enforcement and a prosecutor that still think that these confessions are valid. Right. But you took the chance on doing the DNA test mm-hmm. and it didn't match, right? The, the, the glove don't fit. You must have quit. Right. Um, so I think that's the proof. Yeah. That's the proof that you're innocent. Who cares about the false confession? Because not only did we have these two false confessions, we had what? Any, you know, 50. Well, 50 to 60 reported. I yeah. mean, so it, it's just basically, you know, it, it makes our system seem like such a joke. And I'm sure there's people listening in other countries just going, what the hell is wrong with the America's well, we have law enforcement down there that still want to try these guys for, for this crime, which is... Well, and that's the other thing is the when these guys get out of prison, right? Mm-hmm. They say, this ain't over because 10 years from now, they might come knocking at our door. Mm-hmm. And and that's kind of why they're like actually moving forward with you know trying to prove that they're innocent so we don't have to deal with this anymore. One of the uh, one of the people that they suspected is actually dead now. He's passed yeah, this away. This is a very interesting story. So in 2010, this is Maurice Pierce. Remember, he was the one that they thought was the mastermind mm-hmm. of this whole crime that organized the whole thing. And 
in December of 2010, he's pulled over by a uh, Austin police officer and, uh, and well, two police officers. I apologize. Now his family would claim that, that because he was imprisoned and let's say imprisoned because he was held for quite some time while they were trying to bring him, him to trial, even right. though they ultimately did not. Um, he's stating, you know, that they have, he has some kind of anxiety and all kinds of issues from having been what he believes is harassed by the police. Right. And, um, there's a situation here where he's pulled over and this, this traffic stop does not go well for anybody. He freaks out and he takes off. Freak on, out. He takes off on foot. And eventually one of the officers catches up to him. And now we've got a fight going. Mm-hmm. And during the course of this fight, Maurice pulled a knife off of the officer and he stabbed the officer in the neck. The officer then shot Maurice, which don't, yeah, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Well, he didn't even bring the knife. First of all, <laughs> right, right. well, don't take the guy's knife that has a gun, but there's all, there's all kinds of bad problems here. The, the, thankfully the officer survived and yeah. I don't lay any fault on the officer. I, I believe he, he has to defend himself right. and I think he did the right thing. The only problem is would Maurice have had these issues had he not lived this type of life had he not gone down uh, yeah but you know what came first the chicken or the egg mm-hmm. i mean what we do know was he was carrying around a gun in a mall right when he was a kid when he was a kid not when he was not on the track traffic stop right but what i'm saying is like it's you know he was kind of doing this bullshit way before you know <laughs> so the more of the story don't do bullshit and you won't have a bullshit life. Yeah, he put himself in harm's way. Okay, so we have three of the four still alive, and like we've talked about before, we had these 50 to 60 confessions. So uh, what we do want to bring up is that we had a very odd confession by a, a guy that we already talked about in this case. Yeah, and one of those is from Kenneth McDuff. Now, he was the broomstick killer. He was the one that we said was possibly in the area at the time of the crime. Mm -hmm. He would have been very capable of this crime because he killed many, many women. And he did all of that in the state of Texas. Yeah, and he sometimes worked with other individuals. Yeah, and one thing that he did that, that, that is kind of interesting here, right? He never admits to anything. Right. He never confesses to any of his crimes. He's mm-hmm. they had to bring him to trial for every one of these crimes and he's convicted of them. And it's not until leading up to his to his execution mm-hmm. that he starts talking to police. Now, this is just within days or weeks of his execution. Now, he's executed November 17th, 1998. Mm-hmm. During this time, right around this time, there's an anonymous source that comes forward that tells an Austin TV station, this is KVUE mm-hmm. TV station, that McDuff confessed to the yogurt shop murders. Okay. and it, But they also go on to say that the investigators are having a problem with this because he got certain key details wrong about right. this crime. Right, but it's also years and years, I mean, seven years later. Now- Let's keep in mind, though. And a guy that did multiple murders. He was asked by the original investigators. He was questioned back in 92 right, by, by the Huckabee original. and Jones, yeah. And, and he actually tells them. Now, now at this point, he hasn't really confessed to anything, right? But he tells the two of them, had I done that murder, I would have confessed to it. Why? Because I would have been proud of it. Right. You know, that's this is the kind of a-hole that we're dealing with here. Right. Now, th- here's where I have a big problem with the whole Kenneth McDuff thing, right? Mm-hmm. His name. First of all, it's an anonymous source tells a TV station. Right, right. Sounds a little bullshit. It's very fishy. First of all, we know from doing this show for so long and from the people listening to the show for so long, TV stations, newspapers suck. They make things up sometimes. You know, it would be very easy to say, you know, we cannot, we cannot tell you our source. But someone came forward and stated that he confessed to these crimes. I mean, that would be big news. That would sell papers. That would get people to tune into your TV station. Mm -hmm. The other problem that I have with this crime is leading up to his execution, he ends up admitting to everything. He ends up leading them to bodies that they hadn't found yet. Right. Why wouldn't he just confess to this one as well? He, 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 He stood to gain nothing or lose nothing by confessing to this. Why? Well, it sounds like he did confess to it, though. No, he d- he didn't. 
law enforcement would come out and actively say he did not confess to this. Mm. It was only the media that stated that McDuff had actually confessed to the yogurt shop murders. It's simply put, they have DNA. Test his DNA. Yeah. Well, you have you have the um, the head of the Texas Department of Justice. His name is Glenn Castleberry. Mm-hmm. He actually says in a press conference, "Old Castleberry." He says. When he's asked, did Kenneth McDuff confess to the yogurt shop murders? He says, no, he did not. I've never heard that from anyone that McDuff right. said anything. No like reliable that. source. Exactly. Hey, look, the, the the maybe he didn't confess to it because of their ages. You know, you have two 17-year-olds, a 15-year-old, and a 13-year-old. And maybe that's one of the reasons why he didn't confess. Again, you have DNA. Test his DNA. He, he had been convicted of killing teenagers before. Right. I understand he was convicted of it, but what I'm saying is maybe that's one of the reasons he, I I would have to go back and look at all his confessions to different cases. You know what Mm -hmm. I mean? So like, did he, did he confess to all I did kill this 30 year old woman, but did he, you know, so which, which crimes did he commit that he, that he confessed to and what were those ages of those victims? And maybe he's just not going to confess to uh, the crimes against teenagers. A couple of thoughts on McDuff. You know, yesterday you and I were talking off mic mm-hmm. and you had stated, you know, when we went through the description of the of the man that was seen in the army fatigue jacket right. that was standing in line and he ultimately just ords, orders a soda and he's acting weird. Right. Um, that description did match. You know, we talked about how it, it vaguely matched Kenneth McDuff. The issue is it matched Kenneth McDuff if McDuff were about 20 years younger. You know, the, he it, he is a white man. He does have the pointy nose. He has the clear, deep voice, clean shaven with dark hair. You know, he matches yeah, McDuff, all of those. No scruff. The only problem is McDuff is about six, three and a half, six, four. Mm. And, and when I, so he's about four inches taller than what Croft described the man in the army fatigue jacket as. So that's an issue. He's also about 20 years older than, and I don't think that you would have mistaken his age. Mm-hmm. Because at the time that McDuff was out and running around, not only was he killing women, but he was also drinking heavily and smoking crack. So I imagine that he probably, <laughs> after serving after serving almost 20 years in prison, mm-hmm. having a crack addiction, I, I'm guessing he, he does not look like a young 45. You know what I mean? And on top of that, he's balding in the front and balding in the back by this time. So I don't right. think you would mistake him for no for, party in the front no party in the back <laughs> no party at all with kenneth mcduff yeah the other problem i have with him being the person that committed this crime it he his thing is mm-hmm. he would have extended periods of rape and torture on his victims and what i mean by that is every one of his victims he abducted them from one location and took them with him somewhere spent a good amount of time with them before he killed them. Mm -hmm. My issue with this crime is Kenneth McDuff, I don't think would have had the ability to walk away from these victims. I don't think he would have been able to kill them on site and leave them there. Mm -hmm. I think he would have seen this as an opportunity to take four girls with him someplace else and do, you know, his, whatever he does. Yeah. Which, I see your theory. I, I think the the problem is um, when you take in, you know, when you take over this uh, yogurt shop, that maybe there was something that happened uh, where he had to change his plans. It's, it's uh, quite all I'm possible. saying is that you know uh, these parents deserve some answers. Uh, the victims deserve uh, justice, and mm-hmm. and and they wouldn't get it if it was McDuff. I mean, the just I mean, the justice would already be done, but at least we'd have some closure. So, uh, and I, I don't know tons about DNA, so it's maybe it's an issue where they don't want to test it too much because then eventually it goes away. But uh, I, I think he's somebody that they, I think they should at least test. Well, and it's a little unclear here too because we've we've had these very general statements that come out regarding this case because we have two people. What, even though I don't think it's likely that Kenneth McDuff did this crime, mm-hmm. and as well as I don't think that it's likely that the fast food killer did this crime, and, I, and one point of that being that, that he never raped any of his other victims. Uh, there was there was rape that happened in this situation. I'm not saying he's above it. 
or that he's not capable of it. It just doesn't seem to fit what the two of them did time and time again. Right. The problem here though, that I have is the immediate question goes, well, did they, con- did they test the DNA against McDuff or against the fast food killer? And we get these very general statements from people very close to the case, investigators, authors, media people. Right. Basically what their statement is, is that they've tested this DNA against hundreds of suspects. So anybody that they thought could have been involved in this crime has been tested. Well, that's a very blanketed statement. I would love to hear someone just outright say, Kenneth McDuff, we tested it against his, it didn't match. Right. You know, uh, read the fast food killer. We tested it against his, and there is no match. Yeah, I think with Reed, there there doesn't seem to be as many connections. Now, we have a public and we have a law enforcement that is still hung up on these four guys. They still mm-hmm. want to find a way to charge them. We have the original investigators. Well, it's very much like like we said, West Memphis 3. There's a innocent side for West Memphis 3. There's a guilty side. Mm-hmm. Same thing with Austin 4. We have the original investigators and we have attorneys and people close to the case that are saying, you know what, if, if you want to solve this thing, Mm -hmm. it's very solvable because we have DNA and maybe at some point that this hits on some computer somewhere else in the country, or maybe even in the great state of Texas. And we figure out who did this that way. But in time, if we, if we sit around and wait for that, we're doing nothing productive in the, in the process. So what these investigators, original investigators and attorneys, people close to the case are saying, the way to solve this case is to go back and review what you know. Throw those confessions out. Go back and review the evidence and see where it takes you. Well, we have a big chunk of evidence right here that points to who committed this crime. Now, we talked about police interviewing the customers that came in that day. So we have an issue here, though, because... I don't know how with it being 1991 and there not being surveillance, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know how they, they interviewed all of these people. They must've did a a, a public call to action and say, you know, if you were here on this day, come in so we can talk to you. Now they can check certain sales to verify if people were there or not. And the thing here is though, they have two people that, that they never speak to. Two people Mm -hmm. that are unidentified. And that's it for that entire day. And who are those two guys? Those are the two guys that the married couple said that they saw still in the store just minutes before closing time. Mm -hmm. The two weirdos without yogurt. Yeah, they're sitting in a booth and they're drinking cans of soda. Mm -hmm. So we have all kinds of issues here. The first being that, that law enforcement has never publicly laid out the description of these two men. They've left it very vague which I have a problem with. It's 25 years later. Let's, let's release that description. If, if that married couple gave you a good description, let's release it. Why did those guys not come forward? Okay. And first of all, I want to throw in another thing here. We have that, that other unidentified man that was in the army jacket that was seen just around 10 o'clock that night. Mm -hmm. He had ordered a soda as well. Now we get a description of him from that former police officer, officer Croft. Now, one could one could assume that if you have two guys later that are claimed to be the only two that were not identified, right. yet you have this guy in the army jacket that earlier was in the store and he's not been identified, well, he must have been one of those two men would be what well, I would surmise. He doesn't have to be. He could have been sent in first to case the place and then two other guys are sent in later and they're kind of observing everything, but they're going to be the ones to take over. You open up the back door and then the army, the army savage guy that just goes takes a pee. Uh, well, what I he mean comes through because what we do have evidence of, and, and this would be another thing that I think law enforcement has to come out with mm-hmm. is: Do you have DNA from two people, or do you have DNA for three people? You're exactly right, and and I agree with that statement. But but here's where here's where I arrive at the conclusion that the man in the army jacket is one of the two men that was seen right at closing time. Mm -hmm. And that being that we have statements from law enforcement saying that there were only two unidentified customers for that day. Yet we have two separate stories taking place, one with two guys, one with one guy. So that would be three unidentified customers for that day. What they're stating is there's two. So I'm arriving at the conclusion that the army fatigue jacket guy is one of those people seen sitting at the booth drinking a can of soda right before closing time. 
Mm -hmm. The other thing that you and I have discussed too is what is the motive here? Well, the motive becomes very important when you cannot determine what actually took place, right? We, we, we both agree that we think the motive here was rape. Mm -hmm. Is that correct? Yeah, I think it was sexual. Yeah. We, we don't think that this, the motive was robbery. Why? Because of the small amount of money. Two, they never broke into the office. And, and three, they could have just taken the money and left, right. had everything gone their way. Now, one would argue that it was a robbery gone wrong. I get the argument. However, what I'm stating here is that I see a situation where you have two teenage girls closing a store on a Friday night. All right. They, they claim that it was very important to go back and talk to every customer from that day. I get that. But what I'm getting at is I wonder if they talked to the customers from the previous Friday. If, if the, in fact, the motive was rape, somebody knew that that store was being operated by two teenage girls that were unattended by anybody else. They, they see this is the opportunity. Yeah, but if they didn't question anybody on other days that attended the yogurt shop, uh, that information is long gone, and those witnesses are long gone. And if they did come forward, how reliable would they be? That's correct. That's correct. The, but the thing here is I'm, I'm going to stick on motive for a while, okay? The other issue is if, if the motive was in fact rape, well, then there was a murder that was used to cover up this rape. And furthermore, a fire that was set to cover up the rape and the murders. Mm -hmm. Now, what we do know, one bit of evidence that we do know is that the lighter fluid that was used to set the fire was not present in that store until this robbery took place. Therefore, whoever did this crime brought the accelerant into the store with them. Right. This seems a little pre-planned to me. I wouldn't bring lighter fluid to a robbery. Well, that's why there's a lot of speculation in the city of Austin that for some reason that this was some kind of insurance fraud or, or, or some kind of scandal like that. Yeah. And I've, I've heard those arguments. The thing that, that I have a problem with on those is that why stick around and do the rape then? If that's, if that's the actual case, you well, know what I mean? There's some sick individuals. Yes. I, I get that there's plenty of sick individuals, but, but a job is a job. You see what I'm saying? It, it would make more sense to me. No, that, that's, it's called a crime, not a job. Right, but they're, crime. they're hired to commit this crime. Mm -hmm. And it would make more sense to me to get in there, do the job, and leave rather than to spend an amount of time in the crime scene. Yeah, and then normally I like to go down those you know conspiracy rabbit holes. This just seems... Captain Conspiracy. Captain Conspiracy. <laughs> For the last time, people, I was I was just trying to be nice to Alex Jones and say I was fans the, of his. The captain I'm not really a, doesn't like... <laughs> I really do not like Alex Jones. I just watched a couple... Sometimes... I'm just glad that we got to bring up Captain Conspiracy for a second because sometimes, yes, I go down a couple rabbit holes and I watch his videos. I do believe he has an agenda. I do not like that agenda. I think a lot of the stuff he brings up is complete malarkey horseshit. Alex Jones, bad jib. Bad jib. I do not like his jib. I, I, I'm just saying that overall, I don't think he's like some horrible person and deserves to die or anything. I think he has kids. And and he's trying to make a living, and and I think he's he's his agenda is money and all this other bullshit. You know, he says a bunch of bullshit for my. Anyways, what the captain's trying to say here is that the insurance scheme, the insurance conspiracy, mm -hmm. is far fetched, right? At best, right? It's far fetched, like a lot of Alex Jones's ideas. Yeah, and so it, that would be a whole. It take us a whole another day or two to explain that whole conspiracy to you. So we. We don't believe in it, and we don't mm -hmm. need to go through why. All right, go on. Yeah, back to my rant. So I think here, all I'm trying to say, right, I just want to go into the short, quick theory of it, right? The two guys that were seen in the shop just before closing, I think they were sitting at the booth. I don't think anybody ever re-entered the building afterwards. I think that they, one of them got up, locked the front door. The other one approached the register. If you look at a diagram of the actual crime scene, they were sitting in the booth that was closest to the register. At mm -hmm. the crime scene photos that are shown later, that booth, that table is the only table that sits there with an empty napkin dispenser, right? They we we said that the the women the couple had stated that they had saw the girls refilling the napkin dispensers. Right. The only one that wasn't filled was the one at this table. The only one that didn't have a chair put on top of the table was this table as well. I think they got up and they took control of the situation. I think they were targeting the two teenage girls that were there. 
I think the motive was sexual. I think that unfortunately the other two younger victims just happened to be there that night. That was a variable that they had not planned on. I do think that the army fatigue jacket guy did go back to the restrooms at some point because that area is blocked off from the rest of the store. He wanted to double check that there was actually nobody back there. There wasn't a male manager or additional staff back there that night. They wanted to carry out what they were going to do. Mm -hmm. I also think that the, 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 what kept throwing me off was this backdoor situation, okay? Because in the confession of these guys, they state that they had left the back door open and came in later. And police and firefighters find this back door open. The thing here is, what I was able to figure out last night is that the, the building did have a sprinkler system. I think that this back door was just basically left open to let that fire burn as long as it possibly could to burn off as much evidence as possible before that sprinkler system would kick on and maybe possibly put out the fire. And possibly just the way they left as well. Yeah. Yeah. It could have just been happenstance. We're going to leave here and, and, and just, you know, leave it open. It makes some sense. Yeah. Now, one, one thing here, Captain, I'll throw a whole little conspiracy since you like them so much, right? Yeah. All right. So we have the neighbor, the neighbor statement. I would love to hear what that full statement is or read that full statement because I have some problems with that statement. This guy says he never hears any screams. He says he hears popping noises Mm -hmm. and he goes outside to investigate and he sees the door open and that's when he sees the fire. Now, I want to know how long it was from the time that he said he heard the popping noises to the time that he went outside and saw the fire, because we know that it took some time for this event to take place. If he went out immediately and saw the fire that when then that story is complete malarkey, that Mm -hmm. would make no sense because then he would have, he would have seen the killers leaving the building, fleeing the building, which he did not say that he saw anybody. Mm -hmm. Here's a little thing here. Uh, I hope that they tested the DNA of that store owner next door. Okay. I think you're reaching there, but uh, yeah, I'm sure. I think at the end of the day, they have this DNA and, and any possible suspects instead of trying to get people to falsely confess. Mm-hmm. How about you just test that DNA? Yeah. That's really the only good thing in this entire story here is that they have DNA. I think they'll catch this person or persons eventually. Well, hopefully, I, I believe this family and um, and the victims, like I said, uh, deserve justice and, and deserve some answers. All right, wrapping up, we have our recommended reading for this week. It is Wolf Boys by Dan Slater. You can pick that up by going to our website. This is the true story of a couple teenagers that joined the Zetas, which is one of the worst, most brutal Mexican drug cartels out there. Mm-hmm. You have a, a story about a good nature teenager that turns into a feared assassin. So that's Wolf Boys by Dan Slater. Go to truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page and check that out. You can purchase that along with anything else through the Amazon banner. And follow us on social media at True Crime Garage. We are on Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, YouTube. Our YouTube channel is... uh, Blowing up. It's starting to blow up. (laughs) But uh, the Instagram bet, I won. And now we did a double or nothing. So if you're not on Instagram, not following us, it's a good way to see kind of the characters of each case. Mm -hmm. We kind of try to post a bunch of pictures of each case, uh, you know, different crime scene details and stuff like that. So you kind of get a a visual idea of what's going on in these cases. So it's not just our nasally drones. That's right. All right. Thank you all for listening. And thank you, Captain. We will see everybody back here in the garage next week. And until then, be good, be kind, and don't litter. And don't smitter. list you know and trust is now Angie, and we're so much more than just a list. We still connect you with top local pros and show you ratings and reviews, but now we also let you compare upfront prices on hundreds of projects and book a service instantly. We can even handle the rest of your project from start to finish. So remember, Angie's list is now Angie, and we're here to get your job done right. Get started at Angie.com. That's A-N-G-I, or download the app today.